and, and this is true, and he knows this. Uh, it's nothing I've never said to him and to his face, that when Baldy talks football, like, I love, we love football, but that guy is the guy that I listen to. I never, I, I don't ever, ever, you know, I listen to you, buddy. Thank you, cuz. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's that time of the year. Yeah, I don't know it's if you're, time uh, you're break, So are you breaking down film? You've been looking at all yeah. the uh, the draftees? I just broke down uh, Luke McCaffrey. Um, you know, he, you know, I, I Christian's brother. I know the family really good. But I'm telling you, this Luke McCaffrey, he played at Rice the last two years. He started in Nebraska. Um, he is – he's a bigger – He's bigger than his brother. He's faster than his brother. Like, I don't think he's – he's not a running back. He's a slot outside receiver at six foot two. But if you want to just see sensational catches, plug in the tape the last two years of Luke McCaffrey. Like, I, I broke him down. I broke down, I think, which is the best slot defender, slot corner in the league yesterday, Mike Sanristol. Of the Michigan Wolverines. Yes, yes. He was born, He's born in terrific. Haiti, but yeah. He is a terrific slot corner. Um, a great tackler, diagnoses plays very, very fast. Um, you know, been a two year starter there for the Wolverines. You watch him in the championship game against Washington. Um, he's all over the field. So, I mean, I'm just taking different guys, different positions, you know, every single day. You got to, you got to kind of just, Love what LSU's Pro Day produced yesterday. Kind of makes you go back and re-watch the Heisman Trophy winner, Jaden Daniels and Malik Neighbors, and just the connection those two guys have had the last two years. Yeah, Neighbors is ridiculous. I mean, he's – it's amazing because there's three great receivers coming, like yeah. three game-changing between Marvin Jr. and Rome and Neighbors. I mean, three just – incredible receivers yeah there is and you really i mean it depends on who you talk to you, you can stack them any way you want to stack them and so it really what i think is going to happen because is we have a, we have quarterbacks receivers and offensive tackles at the top of this draft and there's a lot of quarterback needy teams and you're going to see those guys get pushed up like they do but I think teams like Arizona, teams like the Giants, if they don't go quarterback, I mean, there's some teams at the top that need receivers, including the Steelers. You go through the list of them. Yeah. And I, you yeah, know, my man Joe Ben's like, the Steelers are got them. Like, hey. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that receiver room right now, it's George Pickens and Calvin yeah. Austin and who, and who else exactly? Uh, they, they picked up Cordero Patterson, but he's he's more of a returner, you know, yeah. playmaker. But um, – this is – you're going to see teams push up to get receivers, teams push up to get quarterbacks, uh, and you might do the same thing with offensive tackles because that's a group that's kind of difficult to stack as well right now. So let, let me ask you about quarterbacks real quick, and then we'll get into Eagles and everything, but I, I'm fascinated by this, this draft. This, the way it's shaping out to be really, really fascinating. And all the J.J. McCarthy stuff, you and I – we have had talked countless hours about McCarthy. I, and I, look, I get Jim Harbaugh. I mean, I know what, what Harbaugh is going to say about his guy, but it looks like there's a chance quarterbacks could be top five. One, two, three, four, five. Well, I mean, look, the draft, I mean, we, we pretty much feel like the quarterbacks are going to go one, two, three to Chicago, to Washington, New England. We feel like they're all teams – that are in position to draft quarterbacks. And then you go, okay, so the draft starts at four with Arizona. And we feel like Arizona is not going to – so then who's going to come to four? Does the Giants go from six to four? Where does Denver come from? They're at 12. And if you're showing Peyton right now, you're going – if you feel like you can get one of the top three or four quarters, if you feel like you have conviction the way he had conviction about Drew Brees – the way he had conviction seven years ago about Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs jumped in front of the Saints seven years ago to go get Mahomes. If you have that conviction, how much is too much to move up? There is right. a limited amount. Right. You've got yeah. to, it start your team building starts with that. And so there's 
you could see quarterbacks going one through four for sure. And then if you feel like, I don't know, if Michael Penix, if Bo Nix, well, we whatever. we had a chance to, to sit, talk to Penix, man. We, I, I love Penix. Like, I I, let, you, got, you and I love like you, that, sh- that arm is ridiculous. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're the Minnesota Vikings and, you know, you're sitting there at 11 and you've just gotten Houston's number one pick, number 23 in the draft, and now you have 11 and 23 in the first round, you could be, you could see Minnesota with yeah. Kevin McCarthy going, okay, let's go, let's go. And so then you go, well, who would you go for? You know, and so, you know, you look at a guy like uh, Josh McCown is the quarterback coach in Carolina, and he coached Drake May, you know, at Charlotte in high school. There's a connection, you know, so you look at some of the connections here in, in this draft and you go, you Minnesota could move up. Denver could move up. You know, the Giants could move up. You know, the owner of the Giants just came out this week and you said, look, Joe Shane and, and Brian Dable, if you got conviction about a quarterback at the top of this draft, you got the green light. So the, the quarterbacks, as, as always, are going to drive this draft. But we started this conversation about the receivers. And they are, you know, this reminds me of 2014 when there was Odell Beckham and Mike Evans. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, and there was a lot of maneuvering at that point for receivers. Now, not all of them worked out. Not all these will work out. But I feel like when you look at Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, and Roma Doomsday, there doesn't look like a miss in that group right there. How about now? Eagles, obviously, defense. You talked about slot corner. Um, they need massive help. Uh, have you anything pop out to you? Anybody, any kids pop out to you? Um, even back you know, yeah. anywhere through it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you have to go watch Toledo and watch Quinion Mitchell. You just, you just have to watch him. You have yeah. to watch that guy break on a ball and go at six feet and 190 pounds and, you know, running the way that he ran. And you just, I know it's, it's the Toledo Rockets and you're watching him against Bowling Green and some of these. Maction, but, baby. But that guy's break on a ball is exactly what you're looking for. His mm-hmm. ability to play off man, to play in the slot. Like he looks elite, but then you go, okay, there's Wiggins, you know, at Clemson. There's, you know, Terry and Arnold. I like um, Wiggins at Clemson Alabama. too. There's yeah. DeGene Cooper, you know, at Iowa. And you just look at these guys. And, and you know, you that defense, that Iowa defense was great. To, I mean, they had no was, offense, and all that defense was amazing. He was a big part of it. Huge. And so that's a group that's difficult to separate. And when you talk to guys, you know, this business about what what's going to separate them, and, you know, the Eagles sitting there at 22, and, you know, in the second round they've got, you know, picks 50 and 53, you know, are the Eagles, and we've seen how we maneuver, you know, in the draft, um, we just saw, you know, one of the great, you know, Eagles retire in Fletcher Cox. I remember, you know, way back in 2012, they moved up to get Fletcher. Like I could see them going, if there's an elite corner, if there's an elite defensive end in this draft that they feel like Dallas Turner, whatever, I can see the Eagles packaging picks to go get an elite player after they filled so many slots. Um, you know, through free agency. But, you know, I think there'll be a good corner, an elite corner at 22 right now. Well, let's look at the Eagles. Let's let, let's go there, and then I want to go big picture with you. But let's look at their defense for a second. And they just got to get more out of those draftees. I mean, we talked about Jordan Davis. And, and you know, listen, you got to expect more out of your guy. He's not – if he's just a run specialist, that's not good enough. He's got to no. get on the field, man, and he's got to be impactful. Well, he's he was the 13th pick in the draft, okay? And when he was drafted, I said, okay, Georgia rotates their defensive lineman. We never saw him on the field for a long period of time. Um, I thought conditioning and pass rush are going to be a problem for Georgia. Uh, yeah. I, you can show me all the highlights you want of him yeah. pushing the pocket and, you know, using his size. I can't you, – you know, it's hard to find him. In any drive in two years, where he's on the field five plays in a row, that he was invisible the second half of the season. We so, were watching tape. We were looking at the tape. everywhere you look. He's not there, and you can't have that. No, and so he's got a. I think he's there's a lot 
you know, it starts with his weight and condition. It starts there. Then you got to go, okay, who, now they, they, you know, obviously Vic Fangio, new defensive staff, new defense line coach, got to be coached right. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot. We saw Jalen Carter start the season in game busters kind of invisible the last month of the yeah. season. Um, you know, so they've drafted three guys in the first round the last two years. And look, I don't know what's going to happen to Hassan Reddick. You know, you go out and you get Bryce Huff. He's never been a full-time starter. He started seven games two years ago at a need. Well, he's never been a full-time starter. He played 43% of the snaps. Like, I think he's a pass rush specialist. Okay, you got to get there. You got to get to, you know, pass rushing downs for Bryce Huff to be at his best. Um, otherwise, he's a very undersized player um, that, you know, if you're playing a team that wants to pound the football on you the way I think Washington, some of these teams will, uh, you know, you, you better have a different guy at that position right now. So, but yes, it, it starts with getting more out of their three first round draft picks in the last two years. So Jeffrey Lurie spoke down at the owners meetings and kind of gave the, listen, when we looked at Nick Sirianni and judging it all, we decided that it would be, you know, uh, haphazard or foolhardy to move that quickly and to replace him. What, what did you, what did you think of what Jeffrey said? And like you and I were, were kind of torn. We were mystified by how they looked and, you know, we both liked Nick Sirianni, but you know, that offense, he's got to step in and he's got to be able to take control. I, you know, I was just curious about what you thought of what Jeffrey said. I didn't have to, too much to think about what Jeffrey said. He said all the right things. I mean, the yeah. guy's been in the playoffs three years in a row. He's been, you know, he's been within a quarter of winning a Super Bowl. Like, you don't blow those guys out. Give them the chance to replace the coordinators with Vic Fangio, who they wanted last year to begin with. Um, you know, and, and then he kind of spurned them a little bit and went to Miami. That's fine. Coaches can make their own decisions. You know, and to go get Kellen Moore, let him, you know, be the leader of the pack. Give him a new staff. Uh, restock uh, the shelves, so to speak. Uh, the, the defense was dreadful. Um, the tackling was dreadful. The secondary was outside of Washington was the worst in football last year. So let's, you know, let's them kind of look at, okay, Chauncey Gardner Johnson, let's them, you know, bring in Devin White and see him get healthy, see if they can become a better linebacking core. Some of the things that they addressed in free agency, but I, I you know, I would, the, 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 the collapse is the collapse. It's um, it, it's almost unprecedented how bad they were after being 10 and one, how yeah. good they were the first 11 games, and how bad they were, you know, the last uh, seven games of the season. Um, so I, I, I didn't think that he was going to get blown out. I didn't think he deserved to be, but at the same time, he had to have better answers than what he gave us over that stretch of time. Well, that was the thing. Like, and you and I were in there during the collapse and looking at that tape and were mystified at what we saw. Um, you saw, I mean, obviously, Brian Johnson just did not fit well in that position. You saw an offense. You saw Jalen regress. You saw him leave the pocket way too early and get flush out and, fl you know, get fl flushed well, we out. You saw a lot of things that just get – it. you saw a lot of things, because, like, look – I could go talk to guys in the locker room and I can get, I can get their, their take. Yeah. But that's as an Eagle fan, you're like, something doesn't feel right about AJ Brown. The quarterback looks detached. Did anybody want to tackle on that defense? Like those things all fall on the quarterback's lap or on the head coach's lap period. Like that's on the coach. Like you gotta, you, you, I mean, if there's issues on the sideline, with AJ Brown, the quarterback, because those things don't look right. To any Eagle fan, any football fan, the things that happen don't look right. And all of the the spin that we would hear is meaningless to me. Like this isn't how Yeah, you always look team. through that. Yeah. You you can't you can't just sort of brush those things off the way they brushed them off. Like they look like they're real issues to me. Why why couldn't they get the running game back on track? Why did they go away from it? Like that's on that's not on Brian Johnson. That's the head coach going, run the ball. Yeah, you know, like 
You know, the pressure situation never made any sense. Like, we would watch it, and there was nowhere for Jalen to go to the football on a hot read. Like, basic stuff. You know, we, we'd sit there every day and marvel at what Shanahan was doing, and we'd look at, you know, some of those things with ghost movement and all kinds of stuff. And yet, we look at the Eagles' offense, and there was none of that, let alone basic stuff. That went against pressures. Where did built in reads for Jalen to help Hurts out? Well, at some point, it also, and I'm not here to, to rip Jalen Hurts, um, but at some point, the quarterback has to take charge too and go, like, you just have to, like, every great quarterback fixes things on the fly. When the play comes in wrong, you got the wrong formation, the quarterback has to fix it. We've seen Mahomes in a Super Bowl against the Eagles. Play comes in wrong, formation's wrong, he fixes it, touchdown, Kansas City rolls to the second half. At some point, the quarterback has to know the offense forward and backwards. And if things aren't communicated properly, the quarterback has to fix it. That's just what great quarterbacks do. And and so it never gets to the point where it looked last year where there wasn't an answer for a slot blitz or an overload blitz or the things that they had they struggled with during a, a big part of that stretch last year. So Barkley, like we talk about the Saquon coming in as the McCaffrey kind of piece where, you know, I, I, I mean, you look at the weapons now and Kellen Moore has got a lot of toys. How, how much, uh, I mean, how potent and how big of an impact is Saquon? I know how much, you know, you love him and, what he could just do to this offense. I mean, he's a serious upgrade. Well, he is, and he is. A, he's a tremendous talent. But if you, you know, if you if you want to say Christian McCaffrey, I mean, you think about Christian McCaffrey at the end in Carolina. Like nobody thought he could be an MVP candidate in this league outside mm-hmm. of one year in Carolina when he had 400 touches. But then the in- injury set in, and he, you know, like obviously the team was regressing, and you know the quarterback situation wasn't good. And Shanahan said, I'll give what, what that guy in my offense, we're going to see what Chris, what real Christian McCaffrey looks like. And we've seen it for two years, literally from the moment he got there. And the situation isn't that much different than what Saquon left in the Giants. A whole lot of instability, offensive line, coaches, general manager changes, injuries. So it's not just the, 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 the organization. Which was a mess and is a bad quarterback play and bad quarterback play. So now you get better quarterback play. I believe it's the best offensive line, and it's not even close that Saquon will run behind. And if you give some of these backs, a Derrick Henry or Saquon, if you give them a runway and a crease, I mean, you might see the very best because Saquon's not going to be that guy that's just going to make people miss. And Mm -hmm. that's not who he's ever been. But you give him a runway and you give him open space, like that guy can rip you apart. And he's a very good receiver. He's a good teammate. Um, he wants to be here. He just wanted, like all running backs in today's world, he wanted some measure of security. The Giants weren't ready to give it to him. The Eagles did. Um, I think he's going to fit in real well. And well, I don't know what Devontae Parker is right now. You know, maybe he's just a throwaway at this point. We'll take a look. And that's all they're going to do. Like if Devontae can give you some of the magic he gave you in 2019 or 20, that's a, you know, it's dog years in football. Um, fine. But, you know, with Devontae and AJ and Dallas and Saquon and that offensive line, you know, it, it could be and, and a Kellen Moore that has shown that he can build offenses around key personnel people like he did with Keenan Allen last year in, in uh, with the Chargers. Um you no, know, it could be could be fruitful. How much of the, you know? We talk about Fletcher and obviously Kelsey, and losing those you know Titans, those veteran Titans, as being one yourself. You know how big of a loss is that? I mean, obviously in that room. Well, every team loses great players. Every team. So look, Jason Kelsey is a special player. I mean, there's a reason why he's. Um, on this pedestal, not in Philly, but nationwide, and the demand that he's in. He's just a special 
special guy. But, you know, they drafted his replacement, Cam Jurgens, two years ago. He was a part of that. And I think Cam Jurgens could be a really good center. I don't know if he's going to be Jason Kelsey good, but he's right. going to be a good player. Yeah. Um, and I think center is his position. Now, he played guard and had some, you know, had some good moments, but, you know, that's his position. So at some point, Jalen Hurts, Lane Johnson, you know, uh, Landon Dickerson, who they just gave a big contract to, like these guys got to step up, you know, and assume that role. And, you know, they, they kept Jeff Stoutland. Stoutland's a great, great coach. Okay, you know, Fletcher, Fletcher was going to stay Fletcher forever. So at some point, you He's draft Jalen Hurts. too. Jordan yeah. Davis, like you drafted his replacement. And part of the reason, you know, Fletcher did step away was he felt like he's leaving the organization in good hands with top notch talent that can carry the torch for him. So, like, you have to move on. You just do. And who knows what Jason or Fletcher would be this year if they stayed another year? Who knows if they would stay healthy, if they could maintain the level of play? You know, Brandon Graham went backwards last year, he's coming back for year 15. We all love Brandon Graham. We want BG there, but you know he's a part-time player right now, and so um, you know we'll see we'll see what they get out of him. But you can't allow your team to get old and unproductive. You have got to replace. And I'm not saying Jason or Fletcher is not productive; they are. But at some point, you can't let your team just get old, productive, slow, and compete for championships. Yeah, no, you're spot on. Were you surprised at the lack? of movement by the Cowboys. We talked about it. I mean, the fact that they just come ba basically status quo. Well, what I don't understand about Dallas, not that they didn't, that, you know, there, there's one thing going out and chasing free agents and just throwing money at people, you know, that becomes one-year contracts and then you want to get rid of them. Like that, teams make that mistake all the time. But what, what I'm sort of alarmed at is why are they in salary cap hell? Why are that? They, they haven't even paid Mikey yet. They got to figure out the quarterback, and they've already come out and said, we're not going to extend him. He's going to play his kind. So, why are they in this position? Who are they paying? I know Zach Martin got paid last year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Tank Lawrence got paid. But who else are they paying? Like, you know, they paid their corner last year who got, they, they got hurt. All right. Well, the Eagles are paying AJ and Jalen. All right. And, you know, paying Hassan. And they're paying. Like, and then they go out and spend all this money, and they find it to go get Saquon, to get $51 million to rise up. Like, why aren't the Cowboys have that flexibility? That's that's the question I have. Like, who is managing their cap? And we know Jerry's not afraid to spend money. Right. But at right. the same time, you know, Tony Pollard, Ezekiel, like all these guys are gone, and you can't keep your own guys. And Leighton Van Der Esch retires. And, like, why are they in this position? It's crazy, and it it really is. It's it's we talk about it all the time, and like you come back. I don't know how, and that's why it's the Eagles division because I don't know how you come back from blowing that game at home. You're set up. You're set up to at least play San Francisco, right? Like you're set up, and then you let Green Bay come in and torch you at home, and they torched them. Yeah. Well, um, the only thing I'd say about that is. The Cowboys have won 12 games in a row, three years in a row. They won 12 games three years in a row. Nobody's done that. So they, they can win a lot of games, and they looked almost unbeatable at home. Um, you know, but they also, you know, outside of the win against the Eagles, like they really struggled in a lot of games against good teams. So who are the Cowboys? I mean, that's really the question. And yeah. Even if they win 11 or 12 games this year, um, and they might very well do that. Uh, Mike Zimmer's, you know, the new defensive coordinator. You know, they got things, you know, that are changing there. Um, you know, are they going to win any playoff? <laughs> are they going to win a home playoff game? Like, it's it looks awfully difficult for them right now. All right, a couple of quick things. So, is uh, is Duke, your Baldy is a Duke alum. Is Duke going to pull off the upset of top-ranked Houston tomorrow night? Houston or Connecticut? I think Houston. Yeah, I'm pretty it, sure it, it's Houston. It's Houston. Yeah. I don't think they're going to win. 
Like I, I don't I don't see that. They play nine nine thirty tomorrow night, cuz. Yes. Just double check that. Yes. Just double check that. But yeah. uh UConn's got San Diego State tonight. Yeah, yeah. Duke they, they, plays yeah. tomorrow night, nine thirty nine. Yeah. Yeah, night night. There are little, there's two late games tomorrow night. They're one of them. Um so we get through, you know, we'll know almost all of the teams going to the final eight by the time we get to tomorrow night. So I don't think they have it in them because I haven't seen that level of consistency from some of the players that have to step up in that in that type of a spot. Yeah, Houston's good. Houston, yeah, and they listen, they play great defense. I think it's a tough matchup for them. Are yeah. you, is you, wait, you're, you're in Florida, so you're not going to be home. I'd come over to the house for some yeah. Tom Wolf oh, steaks. Yeah, I'm, I'm down here right now. So, uh, <laughs> but I'll be back there next week, cuz I'll be back uh, literally in the film room every day next week. Just All right, well, I'll see you in the film room. I'm going to be coming over. We're going to restart our show, our NFL show around training camp time. So, we're looking forward to that. And you're going you're gonna to do some draft. You'll be with me every week. Uh, yep. which I love, and yeah. uh, you'll be traveling. Well, so you were in Costa Rica, and you're in the Bahamas. Yes. So there's there's other trips that are coming. I mean, I, I'll be in Belize. I'll be in Bali. I'll be in Dubai. Uh, there's other trips because it's you know, yeah. No, it's um, you know the world's waiting. You know they 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 need to. Uh, I need to see a few things I haven't seen in a while. So Dubai they have needs Baldy. They, they have a hotel in Dubai. It's an underwater hotel. Like oh I need God. to be in that. It's they constructed a, a hotel underwater. Like I need to be in that hotel. Like I, I need. I, to I love it. Well. Yeah. It, they're going to change it from Dubai to Dubaldi. Okay, that's that's good. good call <laughs> like that. We might we might do some breakdowns from there, cuz. I like it. I like it, my brother. I love you, man. I'll I talk know, to you next week. I'll see you yeah. next week. Film room's open for you. Thanks, pal. See you, you brother. Bet. The great Brian Baldinger.